Hello and good morning, CSI 158, Section 844 students for the fall semester, the second eight-week term at Anne Arundel Community College. Today's Packet Tracer tutorial is going to be on Packet Tracer Activity 6.4.2.4, and this one is very straightforward and very quick. So we're going to be calculating and configuring an IPv6 summary route. And we're going to be putting that route onto, I believe, router R1. So let's go ahead and take a look here. The background, uh, we're going to configure a summary route for all the networks R1 can access through R2. So R1 is configured with a loopback interface. Instead of adding a LAN or another network to R1, you can simply use a loopback interface to simulate and to simplify testing. All right, so first we need to calculate the summary route for R1. So when summarizing an IPv6 address, we need to check the prefix, right, the global prefix. In this case, as you can see here, uh, for the interfaces that we're looking at or the networks that exist behind router 2, specifically on serial 001 and 010, we have uh, slash 64s. On the serial 000 interface, we've got a slash 126. And so what we're going to do now is it says list the four segments of each of the networks, right? So here are the two networks behind router 2 that are part of the R4 LAN. Well, I should say this one's part of the R4 LAN. This one's actually the point-to-point -point interface between R2 and R4. And then same thing over here for the R3 LAN. So we've got the R3 LAN network, and then we've got the point-to-point -point serial interface between R3 and R2. And as you can see here, they've actually done some of the work for us. Uh, so it's basically asking us to list out these four networks that we just took a look at. And summarization with IPv6 is very similar to summarization with IPv4. And it says the fourth segment is different, right? And so what they mean by the fourth segment is the fourth hextet, right? Because remember that we have hextets and they're separated by colons, right? You can see the colon is the separator here for IPv6. So the fourth hextet becomes the interesting hextet because we've got D, we've got C, we've got B, and we've got A. So prior to that, those 16 bits, these 16 bits, and these 16 bits are identical. And the reason, <clears throat> excuse me, the reason I'm saying 16 bits is because we need to remember this is hexadecimal, so each character that you see here is actually a hex character. So 2 would be represented in binary as 0, 0, 1, 0. So, and then you have the 0 next to it, and that's just 0, 0, 0, 0. And then the same thing for the next 0, 0, 0. And then 1 is 0, 0, 0, 1. And so as you can see, we call this a hextet, and I'll write that out here so we'll say hextet. The reason we say this is a hextet is because each hex character that's in this string of hex characters separated by the colon actually represents four binary digits, or four bits. And so when we add these together we get 16. Whoops, not too good of a six there. All right. So just like IPv4, where if we had, you know, 172.16.0.0, and then 172, whoops, 16.1.0, 172.16.2.0, when we go to summarize, we're looking for the interesting hextet, or I'm sorry, well, the interesting octet with IPv4. So we're looking for the interesting octet here, right? And with IPv6, we're simply looking for the interesting hextet. And by interesting, what I'm saying is the hextet that is no longer the same as the rest of the networks we're going to be summarizing. And so that's why they have them listed out here, because you can see these are all the same, these are the same, and these are the same. So here's where it gets interesting for us. So now let's go ahead and take a look at how they arrived at that binary representation 
for the hex characters A, B, C, and D. So we know that the value of A in hex is 10, the value of B in hex is 11, the value of C in hex is 12, and the value of D in hex is 13. And so if we know what the binary value is, I'm sorry, the decimal value, then we can quickly figure out the binary value. So we need to remember, and this is where some students will become confused. So remember, the A is by itself. So it's not just if it was 10, right? It wouldn't simply be, and I guess we should talk about the values of these positions here. So this one has a value of eight. If we're just looking at the binary character, so it's eight, four, two and one. So for 10, I could put one, zero, one, zero, right? However, there's more to it than just this. So remember the A is by itself and we've used one of the rules of IPv6 here, which is we've dropped the leading zeros, right? So by simply putting one, zero, one, zero, you would not want to go ahead and then say, you know, zero, 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 and add your zeros in on this side, right? And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to back up over that. Let me see, what was the undo? Yeah, the Z, that was right. So we're going to say, we're going to back those zeros out of there, and we're going to take that off. So remember, when we're representing it, we need to remember that the leading zeros have been dropped, right? So we've we've dropped the leading zero. So the leading zeros are gonna show up first. So the first zero represents, in hex, represents these four binary digits, right? These four bits. And then the second zero, and then the third zero. Now we deal with the letter A, which has a decimal value of 10, which would be 1010, zero, zero, right? And then so B, the same thing. So we do with the four zeros, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then 11. So it's gonna be 1011. One, one. And then we've got C, which is 12. So again, we put our leading zeros in here, or the bits for the leading zeros, because we're doing our hex to decimal, right? And there's the decimal, so we do the hex character, which is the A, we convert that to our decimal, and then we bring it over here to binary. Because we're gonna to try to figure out what our prefix length is going to be. So 12 would be 1100, zero, zero. and then finally we've got 13, which is gonna be 1234, 1234, 1234, and then 13 is eight and four, and then zero and one. And if you take a look over here, you can now see this is how we came up with these numbers that show up in the exercise, right? So we've got four bits, I'm sorry, we've got four bits, four bits, and four bits that match, right? And then this bit right here is the last bit, and I'm gonna try to make a little dotted line down here. All right, and so that's where they no longer match. So let's take a look and see what we've got. So we know, we'll come up here to this, actually we'll take a look at this guy. So we've got 16, 16, and 16. So 16 times three is 48. So we know that 48 bits match already. So then we've got 52, 56, 60, and then one bit right there, 61. So right now we know that we're dealing with a slash 61 for the prefix length. Remember, we don't say subnet mask with IPv6. So the prefix length is going to be a slash 61. And the question is, what is that value going to be? And again, this is very similar to IPv4, where we need to take into account the fact that this bit position, the value is on with the one. And we already know from doing our calculations that if this is one and this is two and this is four, or, remember we're talking about binary, that that would be eight, right? And so ultimately what we're gonna end up with, and I'll write it down over here so it's kind of out of the way, is 2001 colon DB8 colon 5F73 colon, and then again, we can drop 
the leading zeros, right? And we can come down to the number eight and then colon, colon, 61. Oops, colon slash 61. All right, so you can see it says copy the matching bits and then fill in the remaining bits with zeros to determine the summarized network address. And there it is right there. So this is going to be a summary, a static summary route and we're going to configure a directly attached static summary route on R1 and this is going to be the value that we use for our static summary route. So let's go ahead and pull up R1. I'm going to leave the writing there and hopefully it's not going to be in the way too much. Alright, so we're going to pull R1 up here. Things are running a little slow. And in fact, I can just drag R1 over here out of the way. There we go. All right, so we can see what's going on here with R1. So we'll go from user exec mode into privilege exec. And then from privilege exec, we're going to go into global config. And if we're going to be doing a summary route, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to be doing a uh, directly attached summary route on R1. And so what this would look like is we're going to say IPv6. And then if you do the question mark, let me stretch this out here. All right, so we're going to do IPv6, and then you can see where the route option is for configuring static routes. So IPv6 route, and then if we do a question mark, it's going to be looking for where typically with IPv4 you would put the network portion and then the subnet portion. I'm sorry, the net mask portion, you do the network portion and then the, the net mask. What we're going to be doing here is we're simply going to be putting in the IPv6 prefix. And so we know it's going to be 2001 colon DB8 colon 5 Fox 73 colon 8 colon colon slash. And this is our prefix length here. And if this was IPv4, we'd be saying it's our subnet mask. But since we're dealing with IPv6, it's going to be referenced as the prefix length. And so there is our summary route. Now, how are we getting from router one to our next hop? And that's where it says it wants a directly attached summary route. And I should have taken a look, but let's take a quick peek here. I'm pretty sure it's serial 000, and it is. All right. So directly attached is going to be serial 000. We could put an administrative distance on here. Maybe if we wanted to do a floating static uh, IPv6 summary route, we could certainly do that. However, this is all we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding in that summary route. And as you can see, very straightforward, right? Your completion percentage is moved to 100 out of 100. However, let's go ahead and check to make sure that PC1 can ping PC2. And again, the long pole in the tent for this exercise are the most uh, time-consuming piece is to work through uh, that summary route calculation. I know that they've provided it for you here, but it's always good to work it out because I can guarantee that on the Cisco exams, <laughs> they will not have it worked out for you. You're going to be required to figure things out on your own. So let's go ahead and take a peek here. It wants us to ping PC1, should be able to ping PC2, and they do not have the PC IP addresses in the addressing table. So we're going to have to hop on to PC2 here real quick and let's take a look and see what his, my guess is it's going to be colon colon 10 is typically they use like dot 10 with the IPv4 for the PCs. So let's take a look at the IP configuration here. And it is not. D colon D. Boy, it's a mess. So 58 Fox Fox FE7. I'm wondering, I can't cut and paste that. And so let me uh, jot this down right really quick. So we've got dot D and then 2D0 colon 58 Fox Fox colon FE7 Baker colon E266. All right, so it turned out to be a little more work than I had anticipated. All right, let's jump over to PC one 
and now let's go ahead and try to get our ping command in here. So we're going to be pinging 2001 colon DB8 colon 5 Fox 73 colon, and he is on subnet D colon, and let me make sure I wrote this down properly. So 2D0 colon 58 fox fox colon fox echo seven baker colon e266 and all i can say is i hope that i wrote that down correctly all right because i do not want to type that in again okay so pc1 can ping pc2 and it says they should both be able to ping the loopback zero interface and that has been provided thank goodness so let's give that a try so ping 2001 colon db8 colon five fox seven three colon six colon colon one all right so we can ping that from pc1 and now let's pull pc2 back up and for our final check here let's make sure that we can ping the loopback address and again the loopback interface is it's a, it's a fantastic way to simulate a network behind a router and that's really what we're we're trying to do here. So db8 colon 5 fox 73 colon 6 colon colon 1. All right, and so we've got connectivity all throughout. And the reason it didn't ask you to ping PC2 to PC1 is typically if we can ping from one side to the other, it should work in most cases from the other side back over to PC1. So, all right. So this concludes the Packet Tracer tutorial for Packet Tracer Activity 6.4.2.4, where we actually went ahead and calculated out an IPv6 static summary route that was directly attached. It was a directly attached summary route. And we learned about converting from hexadecimal to decimal, and then from decimal to binary. And we really saw that uh, summarizing as and it goes the same for subnetting summarizing an IPv6 has some similarities with IPv4 that we were able to leverage in terms of determining the last uh, similar bit in our calculation to get our prefix length and that's another significant difference remember that with IPv6 we wouldn't say that oh we have a slash 61 subnet mask what we would say is our prefix length is going to be slash 61 all right, so thank you for watching. Hopefully this activity has cleared up any confusion that you might have had or difficulty with uh, summarizing and configuring IPv6 directly attached static summary routes. All right, have a great day.